Parshat Vayetchanan. It's a pleasure to be back and to share with you some wonderful Divrei Torah from the Mikdash HaLevi, Sefer Mikdash HaLevi, written by my late grandfather, Yosef Tzvi HaLevi Duna, who was the Ravid in London. Uh, and uh, really tremendous material every single week, one after another Divrei Torah, which are just perfect, beautiful. And this, fir- this first one is just a Cheshben one. You'll see in a second what I mean. And then we'll get to the second one, which is kind of the meat of what I'm going to say, and we'll have a third one as well. So this first one is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating cheshbon. That means a calculation that's based on a number that appears in Rashi at the beginning of the parsha. So I prayed to Hashem. You know, there's many different words in Hebrew for prayer. You know, the Eskimos have got lots of different words for snow. In Judaism, the snow of Judaism, or the comparable snow as in the Eskimo world, is prayer. In Judaism, for the Jewish people, since the dawn of our history, prayer is such an important function of who we are and what we represent. And there's many different words for prayer in in Hebrew. And Vo'eschanon, Moshe Rabbeinu was praying to Hashem, he wanted very much to go into Eretz Yisrael, that particular moment in time. And Rashi is going to tell us what that moment was. And then we're going to look at another, another Chazal, which is brought in Rashi, which tells us a little bit about the word Vo'eschanon. Vo'eschanon el Hashem ba'eshahi lemer. When was ba'eshahi? What was that particular moment in time when he began to pray? And why did he begin to pray then? to be admitted into Eretz Yisrael that the uh, decree that God had made that he would never enter into the promised land would be somehow withdrawn and he could then um, go to the place that he really wanted, that his heart desired. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, after I had beaten in battle the forces of Sichon, who was the king of the Amorites, Melech HaEmeri, Va'oig, and Og, who was the king of Bashan, after I had beaten them in battle, Domisi, I thought to myself, Shemahutar HaNeder, maybe the uh, vow that God had made not to allow me into Eretz Yisrael had been somehow annulled. And we're going to look into that and we're going to parallel it with something else. Hine, behold, Biyalkut Shimoni, in the Yalkut, in the Medrash, it says, Motzinu Shemosh Rabbeinu Ispalel, Taktu Tfilois. What's Taktu? Tov Kuf Tesvav. That Moish Rabbeinu davened 515 separate prayers, Bichdei She Yizkeli Kones Laaretz, in order that he may merit entering into the land. How do we know that, he, that this specific number is the number uh, that he prayed, the number of prayers that he prayed, Kaminyan Vaishanon. It works out if you separate out the word Vaishanon into its individual component letters, Vav, Aleph, Tof, Ches, Nun, Nun. You'll discover if you add up the numerical value of each of those letters, the Gematria process, you end up with 515. And that means Vaishanon, which is this unusual word for prayer, Vaishanon el Hashem. I prayed 515 separate times to Hashem that He should allow me to enter into Eretz Yisrael. That's why, uh, that's why the word Vaishanon is used to convey this kind of subliminal message that it was 515 prayers. And when did He do it? Vaishahi. He did it. Now, if you're going to look, if you're going to now parallel this, this Yalkut, this Medrash with Rashi, When did he begin praying? He began praying after following his victory against Sichon and Oig. Because now he thought to himself, now one second, let's see what, what's happening here. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this means that I was able to enter into the land of Sichon and into the land of Oig? Do you know what it means? 
Shekdushosa Koroiva Lekdushosa Oretz, because we know that that area, which is today called the country of Jordan, has an element of the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. We know that two and a half tribes live there. It's not quite the same Kedusha as Eretz Yisrael, but it's got Miktsas Kedushosa. Some element of the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael also exists in that piece of territory that's Eretz Sichoin V'oig, and therefore he felt that somehow things might have changed, that th somehow things had moved in his direction positively. He was permitted to participate in the conquest of the land of Sichoin and the land of Oig, and therefore this vow, this decree that God had made that he should not be allowed to enter, into Eretz Yisrael was no longer as powerful, was no longer as relevant as it had been before these two battles had taken place. Kavar Hutar Miktsas Haneder. Somehow an element of the vow, an element of the decree, an element of the forbiddenness had been annulled, had been reduced. The Neder Shehutar Miktsasai Hutar Kuloi. And we have a principle that when a Neder has been somewhat annulled, it has been completely annulled. Now that we know this piece of information from Rashi, that when this occurred was after the victory against Sichon and Oig, that this Cheshben has somehow the number of Tfilois that he davened is somehow related to the moment in time when the Tfilois occurred, when they began happening. That's what the Mikdash Halevi says, a Kavishan of Kavishan of Ar, as I'm going to explain. Shekain Hine, let's look into it a little bit more closely. Aaron Hakohen, Moshe Rabbeinu's brother Aaron, Nifta Barishan Lachaydesh Hachamishi. When did he die? Do you know when he died? He died on the first of Av. Listen to this Cheshman. It's unbelievable, it's beautiful, and it's perfect. Aaron Hakohen, the high priest Aaron, brother of Moshe Rabbeinu, dies on the first of Av. Now, after he died, what happened then? Immediately after Aaron Akoyen died, you have to look at Bamidba Perik Kofalaf, you'll see that there were eight separate journeys that occurred after Aharon died. Now, listen carefully. We know that every journey occurred at the daytime. They, ne they never traveled at night. They never journeyed during the night time. After each journey, they spent the night wherever they were. They encamped wherever they were. So all of those eight journeys took place during the day. And at night, the journey ended and they rested overnight in the particular place where they found themselves. Nimtza. Listen, we're back to the Cheshben again. Nimtza. Kishmoinas Hamasois, we discover, having made this Cheshben, that these eight journeys, Histayamu Betisha Ba'av, when did they end? They ended after eight days. One, first of Av, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth of Av. Now they've rested overnight. It's now the ninth of Av, Betisha Ba'av. Oz, at that moment in time, Nerach Mispeid. That's when they began eulogizing Aaron on the 9th of Av. And it makes sense because we know we know that the 9th of Av is a day that's designated, has been established as the correct day for mourning from then and for all future time, for, for the entirety of Jewish history. So the 9th of Av was when they said Hespedim for Aharon. Okay, got it? Right. The Cheshbon continues. After the Hesped, the eulogy, and the particularly intense mourning that took place on the 9th of Av, there was now a 30-day, what we call the Shloshim period, the 30-day mourning period that follows the um, intense mourning period that we have at the beginning. We, we call that the Shiva. They did this intensely for one day. And following that, they kept 30 days, Shloshim, days of mourning. When is that? So what, what, what is the 30th day? Listen carefully. 
when did those days end? They ended on the 9th of Elul, because that's the 31st day. The 9th of Elul is the day after the Shloshim that began on Tisha B'Av. Le'achar siyum oisam Shloshim yemei bechi. After the 30 days of mourning, that's when the battles began with King Sichon and King Oig, these two kings that stood up against the Jewish people and that needed to be beaten. That's when the battles began. Okay, now the Cheshbon is going to continue. There were three stages, three separate set-piece battles that took place in the Melchemes, uh, in the battles, in the war between the Jewish nation and Sichon and Oig and Emoiri. Hamarocha Arishoina, the first stage. His Nahalok Neged Sichon Melech Emoiri. This was a battle against Sichon himself. The king had his own army and his own military, and they fought against the Jewish people. Because they came out, they weren't in Emoiri, they weren't in the land of Emoiri, they came out to battle the Jewish people. That battle took place, that was the first set piece battle that took place between the Jewish nation and their opponents. And it says in the Posuk, listen carefully, and the Jewish people beat them, by sword. And in that way they inherited, they took possession of his land. And they took it from Arnoin till Yaboik until the Ammonite nation. Because Az is the as the name of a place, it also means it's very strong. There was a very strong border between Emori or whatever it was that Sichon was fighting and the Bene Ammon. So we know that that is what took place in the first set piece battle. Hamaroch the second one. His Nahalok and Neged Atzmom. Now they went to battle. The Jewish people now returned. They went on an offensive battle against the Amorites. So the initial battle was a defensive battle uh, uh, between the Melech of Emoiri, Sichon, and the Jewish nation. He'd come out to fight them where they were. Now they went. And they went an offensive battle against Emoiri themselves. What's the Posuk say? You can look at Perik Chof Aleph, Posuk Lamad Base. Vayishlach Moshe Leragel. Moshe sent out spies. Yazer Vayilkudu. Yazer is a place. Vayilkudu Binoiseha. And and they smote or they somehow took possession of the dependencies. It wasn't just the land itself. There were little groups around them that were part of the greater whole. And they dispossessed the Amorites who were there. So there was there was this battle, this set piece battle that took place between the Jewish nation and the Amorites. That was the second stage of the three stages of battle. What about the third stage? That was something that took place against Oig, who was the king of Boshon. The Kvisha Nema Baposuk, and the Posuk says, what does it say? Vayaku Oisaves Bonov, and they smote him. They were victorious against him and his sons, Veskol Amoy, and his entire nation. At Bilti Hishe there was absolutely nothing left of him. Oig Melech Haboshon was wiped out in battle. He was left with absolutely nothing. And they took possession of his land. So those were the three stages of the battle between the Jewish people, Sichon, Emoiri, and Oig. Seeing as we know that every battle that's ever mentioned in Tanakh never took longer than one day. Uh, the battles in those days were not things that took place over a long period of time. They were set-piece battles that took place between two armies. And they took a day, and whoever ended up with more soldiers or more territory, they were the winners. As we find, uh, and this is proven from the fact that in the battle between Avraham Avinu Abraham and the five kings, uh, and the four kings, on behalf of the five kings, so we see that it, it was overnight they got there, they fought the battle, 
and it was over. Um, and similarly, we find in the battle that Yehoshua battled against the Gibeonites uh, in Givon, he took possession of the land, but the day didn't, didn't last long enough and the sun never set and therefore there was light and they could continue the battle until the end of the day. Another proof that a battle in Tanakh always takes one day and one day only. So now, you are holding cup. If you were thinking carefully, then you know that we are now ninth of Elul. That's where we had got to. The three stages of the battle between the Jewish people and Sichon and Moiri and Oig. When did it take place? It took three days. We know that it must have taken place after the completion of the 30 days of mourning for Haran, when was the first battle? Because we know that finished on the 30th of Elul. That's when they got themselves back together. Therefore, the three battles that took place, first battle took place on the 10th of Elul. The second battle took place on the 11th and the third on the 12th. So we've now reached the 12th of Elul. Now, we know from Rashi what he said before was that the prayers only began, Moshe only began praying once he knew that he had been allowed to take possession of and enter into the lands of Sichon and Oig, which had this kind of um, gray area status of not being Eretz Yisrael, but being not Chutzla Eretz either. Somewhere in between, they had somewhat the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael, if not quite the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. And therefore he thought that at this stage, well, if I've been allowed into them, perhaps I'll be allowed to Eretz Yisrael. So he began his prayers to enter into Eretz Yisrael, into the Promised Land, because he wanted to take advantage of the fact that he'd been allowed into the land of um, Emoiri and into the land of um, of Oig Melech Abosham. They had taken possession of these territories which had this kind of Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. Al pi ha'omur, nuchal benoke lagia lamaskone ke Moshe Rabbeinu echel mispalo migoin yud gimul be'elo. When was the first time he davened? Well, we know that until the end of the 12th of Elul, it couldn't have happened because he hadn't yet taken possession of the land of Oig Melech Abosham. So he began davening on the 13th of Elul. Okay, he's still keeping the Cheshman. You're still there with us. Okay, fantastic. Thirteenth of Elo, he begins davening. And so he davened from the thirteenth of Elo until the day he died, which was the seventh of Adar of the of the, which was at the end of that calendar year. Well, actually, the the year began in Tishrei, but the following Adar. That's when he stopped davening because we know that he died on Zion Adar. If we work out exactly the number of days between the 13th and the 6th, 13th of Elul and the 6th of Adar, all inclusive of those days, how many days do we get? Between these two dates, how many days are there? There are exactly 171 days between Yud Gimel Elul, including that day, and Vov Adar, which is the sixth of Adar, the day before Moshe Rabbeinu died. There's exactly 171 days. The Imnaniach. And obviously, he davened three separate tefillahs on each of those days. We know that each day has three separate tefillahs. Shachris, Mincha and Mariv. It begins with Mariv, but we say Shachris, Mincha, Mariv. So on the 13th of, uh, of Elul, in the night, right after the end of the 12th, of Elul, he began davening Mariv. That was the first tefillah of the Vaischanon El Hashem, of uh, the prayers that he prayed to Hashem to be allowed into Eretz Yisrael. How many tefillahs do you have? 171 times 3. 
you can take out your calculator you don't need to i can i can tell you what the number is it's 513 separate prayers tof kuf yud gimel okay now listen carefully when did Moshe Rabbeinu die? He died at some point during the day on the 7th of Adar. So on, this, on Zayn Adar, he still had two opportunities to daven. He davened Mariv and he davened Shachris. And in that way, he adds a further two to this calculation of how many Tfilos he managed to daven between Yud Gimel uh, Elul and when he died in Zayn Adar. What is that? What is, what is the total sum of the number? So we have 513 plus 2, the number is 515.00 goes according to the Medrash, according to Rashi. The whole thing fits in. It's quite unbelievable. The Cheshben of Tfilis that Moshe Rabbeinu davened, that he beseeched Hashem to allow him into Eretz Yisrael, perfectly fits the period of time between the end of the battles between Sichon Oig and the Jewish people and when Moshe Rabbeinu died on Zayn Adar. That's the first Vatorah. The second one is the prayer itself. Ebron, Nov, Eretz, Oretz, allow me to see the land. Let me travel and see. Let me go over the Yardin River and let me see the land, Hatoiva, Asheba, Eva, Hayardin, this beautiful land that's over the River Jordan. Hahar, Hatoiv, Hazeva, Halvonoi. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to go into Eretz Yisrael and I'd like to see it. Yodua Hakushya. Everybody knows the very famous, well-known question. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu say, I want to cross over the Jordan, I want to go into the land, and I want to see it? Why does he need to say, Why does he need to mention he's going to see the land? Obviously, he's going to see it. Would anyone have thought he's going to go in there and wear blindfold? Of course not. If he goes into Eretz Yisrael, he's going to see Eretz Yisrael. It's obvious and absolutely guaranteed that he's going to see Eretz Yisrael if he goes into Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, why bother saying Ebrona vo'ere esa Oretz? we know. Yeshama Farshin, there are those who explain ki Kavanosay shall Mosh Rabbein Oisa Levakesh, she is Sayala Kodesh Bohu Lirat Esa Oretz Hatova. The Possek actually adds a word. It says, I want to see Esa Oretz Hatova. Why would he say that? So the Mepharshim say an interesting pshat. They say, I only want to see the wonderful things of Eretz Yisrael. I don't want to see anything negative. But I want to see the, the, those aspects of Eretz I want to see those aspects of the land which, from which we can derive the obligations that we have in terms of our relationship with Hashem. I, I, I don't want to see anything negative. I don't want to participate in any of the criticism that may exist. In other words, I don't want to be one of the Maraglim. I know I sent the Maraglim, they were good people, and they fouled up very badly. They did a terrible job and they came back and had nothing positive to say. I don't want to be there. I want to see, that's what he's saying. I want you to make sure, Hashem, that I see her. I don't want to, I don't want to even notice. I want to have rose tinted spectacles, rose tinted glasses. I want to look through those glasses and see the most positive things that there are to see about Eretz Yisrael. But having that in mind, we can offer another slightly different explanation. We know for sure that going into Eretz Yisrael has a unique and wonderful aspect to it, which is that you can keep all the mitzvahs which are tluyim ba'aretz, which um, which uh, somehow you, you can't keep them outside of Eretz Yisrael. You can't keep truma, you can't keep maser. There's many aspects of Eretz Yisrael which are unique to Eretz Yisrael. Mitzvah is a tluyos ba'aretz. Ulam, mo'vad zois. Besides 
for this. Yesh no Kedusha Miochedes. There's actually a unique, uh, a almost supernatural Kedusha, which is which is beyond the Kedusha that we're used to. We understand what Kedusha is. We sometimes feel Kedusha in Chutzlar. It's, I don't live in necessarily in a place where there's a lot of Kedusha hanging about, but you do feel Kedusha. You maybe have to create it yourself, but that Kedusha does exist. But there is a unique type of Kedusha, which can only be found in Eretz Yisrael, what the Mikdash Halevi calls Roimamus Nisgova, a sublime elevation. Luchnius Tzerufa Ba Malea Eretz Yisrael. There is a pure spirituality that fills the land of Israel. And this incredible elevation, this unique elevation, this unique spirituality, this purity of spirituality, Tzrichim Lirois Lachush Velisvoig. You need to see it, you need to understand it, appreciate it, you need to feel it, and you need to soak it up. There's a, you kind of need to put on a different pair of glasses when, you want, when you're looking for this type of Kedusha. It's not the ordinary day-to-day -day aspects of living in a special place. You need to be able to appreciate it. You know, when you're a tourist and you go to a place which you've never been to before, you see it in a way that nobody who lives in that place ever sees it. All the vivid colors and the beautiful aspects of that particular place, or sometimes the opposite, some of the, the terrible things in that place, which nobody ever notices because they're so used to it and they see it all the time, you're there. And you, and you really feel it. You hear the noise, you hear the sounds, you smell the smells. You, you completely appreciate your surroundings in a way that no person who's a regular uh, person in that location who lives there all the time ever sees. But that's something which you, if you do live in a place and you don't appreciate your surroundings, which you have to work on on a daily basis. You've got to even wake up in the morning. I live in a really special place or I live in a place which has this aspect or that aspect, which is so unique. And I've got to notice it. I've got to appreciate it. You know, I live in Los Angeles, California. You wake up every morning. The sun is shining. You know, I come from a place where you woke up every morning in England and the sky was gray. So I wake up every morning, I look out of my window and the sky is blue and the sun is shining and you, you really appreciate it. That's what we mean by saying Trichim Lirois Lachush Velispoig. You've got to see it. In other words, it's, you've got to be conscious of it. Then you've got to feel it and you've got to soak it up. Now, we're not talking about the sun shining and the sky being blue. We're talking about this Roimamus Nisgova, this sublime elevation. That is something that requires an, an extra eye, a different kind of eye, so that you can see it in order to feel it and soak it up. The Khan. There's no question about it. That somebody goes into Eretz Yisrael, think he's going to eat from its fruit. Yekayimus mitzvah is going to do the, all the mitzvahs which are clear as Eretz. It's very possible you do all those things and you don't fully appreciate your surroundings, where you are. It's just regular life for you. You know, there's people who come to Eretz Yisrael and they're completely overwhelmed. They come there, they kiss the ground. For them, every brick, every stone, every house, every synagogue, every yeshiva, every person is so amazing, is so special. I mean, how is it possible that these people don't appreciate where they live, what they are a part of, the miracle of Eretz Yisrael, the spirituality of the Holy Land? How is it that because you, you come from outside, you're never there and you truly appreciate it. But it's possible to live in Eretz Yisrael and do all the mitzvahs that nobody else outside of Eretz Yisrael can do and still not fully understand and fully appreciate how special the country is. In order to feel that spiritual elevation, you need to sharpen and strengthen all of your faculties. Without being mechadeid your chushim, you will never feel it. You'll never truly appreciate what Eretz Yisrael is. 
He wasn't satisfied simply to ask Hashem that he can enter into the land, because it's possible to be in the land and not fully appreciate it. He's saying to Hashem, I want to go into the land. Ebron no. But also for Ere, I want to really appreciate it. Give me the Kalim to fully appreciate Eretz Yisrael. This sublime elevation that is in the Holy Land. That is a kind of separate request. It's not Ebron, no. It's for and I want to not just go there and physically be there. I want to see it. I want to fully appreciate how special it is. Even though it's true to say that Hashem never acceded to his request to allow him into the promised land, we do find that God said to him, Go to the, to the top of Pisgah. to the top of Pisgah. And cast your eye. I want you to look in all four directions. And you should see with your eyes. Well, why was he telling him to do that? He was telling him to do that because he says, I'm never going to let you into the land. But go to the top of the mountains so that you can at least, I can be Makayim, the Va'ere part of your Bakosha, even if I'm not able to be Makayim, the Ebrona part of your request. What exactly is the benefit that Moshe Rabbeinu will gain by seeing the land? The fact what we've just said really explains it beautifully. Even though God had not allowed, had not, had not given in to Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, of endless requests, 515 requests. He hadn't at any point lowered his guard and said, you know what, Moshe Rabbeinu, let me think about it. Maybe I'm going to let you in. No, 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 no. The, it was repeated no throughout. Nevertheless, there was one aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu's request that God could, as it were, say yes to. And this was it. This was exactly it. Ulam hu henik lo his damnus le his basem me oisa ruchnius terufa shahoisa masses nafshoi. He could allow Moshe Rabbeinu to get a sense of this pure spirituality that was the desire of Moshe Rabbeinu's heart. That he could do. That wasn't going against what he'd said earlier after the story of the Be'er. Um, that Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't go into Eretz Yisrael by allowing him to see Eretz Yisrael, he wasn't annulling that vow. He wasn't somehow giving in to Moshe's request. He was simply allowing Moshe Rabbeinu to see. And this is what he said. And God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, as it were, so we get an understanding of what this dynamic was. Adam Pashut, an ordinary individual, Tzarich lavoir ba'aretz b'chdei lispaid memeroim musa. If an ordinary person wants to truly appreciate the land, can't do it from a distance, has to go there, has to be there, has to be a part of it, physically located, geographically located in Eretz Yisrael, in order to appreciate its elevated status and its incredible spirituality. Ulam ata b'madregos chagvoya, you, Moshe Rabbeinu, you are the highest level that a human being can ever achieve. You can totally get it. You can completely feel the Kedusha Sa'aretz, the sanctity of the land, and to soak it up. Even if you see it from afar, you don't need to be physically located in it. You can be somewhat distant and see it from the top of Pisgah, and you will be able to soak up that spirituality from the distance that you are at. And therefore I can fulfill your request of Vo'eres Ha'aretz HaToiva, but I can't fulfill your request of Ebra Noel Ha'aretz HaToiva. Alkein so no'e nechor eki loisavoy. Please take a look. Go to Rosh Pisco. Take a look at Eretz Yisrael because I'm not going to let you in, but at least I can I can give you the pleasure of seeing it, which is what you wanted. You would you wanted to have that appreciation of Eretz Yisrael that you thought you needed to go into Eretz Yisrael in order to achieve. But I'm telling you that you can do it from a distance from Rosh Pisco. 
But kan aleinu lizkar. And this is the place for us to recall, to remember. Ki advarim amurim lechai vaisonu lehanik mashmois miyuchedes lezakois ba anu zoichim kayoim lezchus ba ein anu zoichim hayoim. We need to remember and remind ourselves constantly on a daily basis in the great merit, the zchus that we have in our generation, in our day. And for the past 70-something years since 1948, it's going to be 75 years since we have the land of Israel in the, in the hands of the Jews, controlled by the Jews. We are, to, the, to a degree, uh, determining our own destiny as the people who run the country that God gave to us. We have seen a fulfillment of prophecy in terms of the kibbutz Goliath. So many Jews, almost if not more than half of all Jews in the world, certainly all Jews who are committed, live in Eretz HaKodesh, live in the Holy Land. And we have been, we have been zeichet to that, we've seen it. But we've also seen something else. Whereas for the entire Jewish history, we always said, We davened every day, And we had in our mind's eye this wonderful picture of what it would be like when we came back, how we would feel now that we've got it. It's just a country. It's just citizens of Israel. People go about their day-to-day -day lives as if it's an ordinary place. And we've lost that sense of awe that we had from when we were a farm, couldn't see it. And we wanted Ebronov Ere. Ebronov has been fulfilled. Ere? I'm not so sure. We go to Eretz Yisrael, and I'm not sure if we have the Ere element down pat. I'm not sure if we're completely in control of that Ere or Eretz we're much more into the Ebronar. Let's get onto an Elal flight. Well, maybe not Elal. Maybe let's fly United, American Airlines or British Airways. Get to Eretz Yisrael and find the nicest hotel in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or Elat. And eat the nicest food. And there's some, plenty of good restaurants and good wine, uh, which is grown all over Eretz Yisrael, particularly in Golan. We can drink all this fantastic wine, eat all this fantastic food. We can appreciate the country and the fact that we've got it back and that we are in control as Jews, we are in control of the destiny of the country, of our heritage and of our legacy. But the error, that mind's eye, that spiritual eye that Moshe Rabbeinu had even from afar, do we have it when we're there? That's what the Mikdash Halevi says, You know what? We have this incredible opportunity in our generation, in our days. We, the Jewish people, for 2,000 years were kept away from the land of our heritage. We have the ability to be there. What is the most important purpose of, of Eretz Yisrael? Is that we have it, that we have the physical territory, that we're in control of a particular location on the map? That's what it's about? Of course not. Our job, our duty, our obligation is to soak up its spiritual nature. If we miss, this, we miss this memo, we don't read the memo. What's the value of having it at all? What's the point of having it if we don't fully appreciate how special it is? And the elevated level, what we call the Romamus Nisgava, this sublime elevation, which Moshe Rabbeinu was, was asking for and he got, he managed to get it from afar. We can get it from being there, but we have to get it. Otherwise, all we're doing there is we're tourists, we may as well go to Turkey, we may as well go to, to some other point on the globe, whichever country that we visit, because it's just about just going to a place. Eretz Yisrael is so much more than that. Now let's look at this final Dvatora. The Pasuk says that you mustn't add any mitzvahs to the mitzvahs in the Torah. You're not allowed to invent your own mitzvahs and you're not allowed to reduce the number of mitzvahs. We have 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. You can't say, you know what, I like 612 of them, but the 613th, that's not for me. And you can't say if there is a mitzvah, I like doing the mitzvah, but I'm actually going to do more. 
I don't want to keep one day of Shabbos. I want to keep three days of Shabbos. Why? Because I think Shabbos is so spiritual and so special. I'm going to keep three days of Shabbos. You can't do. Beloy say sifu. You can't wear a pair of tittis with six corners and put tittis on each of the corners. There's a, there's a mitzvah to put tittis on four corners and that's it. If you have a beged which has six corners, you don't have to put tittis on it. It doesn't matter. It's not about the corner. It's not how, how about having an extra fringe on the corner of your beged. No. You can't have a beged with three corners either. That wouldn't be allowed. You, you have to do it in the way that Hashem told you. The next posuk, Your eyes, the eyes that saw what God did to this horrible idol, We know that all of those Jews who found themselves in the worship of Baal Pa'ur, they were eradicated. They were, they were wiped out. They're not, they were no longer a part of the Jewish dream of being good Jews and following the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. They were, they were written out of the book. It was over for them. Somehow this posuk is written in correlation to the posuk of Baal Tosif and Loisigru. Says the Mikdash Halevi, Lechoyre Yesh Lebar, we need to explain. Ma shaychus bein halav shal Baal Tosif lebein haposuk habo. What is the connection between the, um, the negative commandment, the prohibition against Baal Tosif, uh, against adding mitzvahs to the Torah, and the pasuk that follows, which talks about, describes the terrible outcome of those uh, who worshipped Baal Pa'ur. What is that? We're talking about this terrible crime, this sin of Avodah Zorah, of uh, worshipping foreign idols, not God in other words. How is this? description, this, this uh, you know, uh, this follow-on, this add-on to the previous posuk, well, what is it adding? How is it enhancing or giving us any kind of explanation or context to the mitzvah of Baal Tosif and Loisigru? The Nir Eloima. There's a Gemara in Soita Daf Beis, Daf Dalad Omid Beis. Rabbi Yechon Yishom Rabbi Shema Yechai. Rabbi Yechonon said, in the name of Reb Shimon ben Yoichai. Listen to what he said. Kol odom ruach. Anybody who has in him arrogance, or her arrogance, they'd be arrogant, self-centered people. Ke'ilu zara. It's as if they've worshipped pagan idols. Ksiv because we have one pasuk in Mishle that talks about arrogance. Toyavas Hashem kol goiv Using the word toy eva, an abomination. Uksiv hosam is a kind of comparative text, it's a parallel text. And it says in Dvarim, you shouldn't bring this pagan idol into your home. And it uses the word toy eva to describe the pagan idol, the idol that isn't God. And by using this word toy eva, talking about arrogance and talking about Avodah the two are brought together as one. Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and Rabbi Yochanan is quoting him in this Gemara and Soita, anybody who is arrogant, it's as if they've worshipped idols, it's as if they have fallen into the sin of idolatry. Kaloima, HaGemara Mashve Lema'ase, Bein Odom Shiesh Gava. The Gemara is making a practical comparison between someone who is arrogant, Gases Ruach, Levein Odom Shoived Avoid Azorah Rachman Litzlan, a person who worships, you would think it doesn't make sense, a heretic and someone who's arrogant. We seem to be talking about two different things here. And yet, the Gemara is a very powerful Gemara, and his strengthened Mikdash Halevi quotes um, um, a Mishnah Shreb Eliezer. What does the Mishnah Shreb Eliezer says? In Perik Yud, Motzinu Af, Hisbat Uschamura Yosef, something that expresses it in an even more powerful stronger way. Listen to what Mishnah Rebbe Yezah says. Somebody who is arrogant, it's as if they've made themselves into a god, takes it even to the next level. It's not as if they've worshipped Avoid Zorah, they've made themselves into an Avoid Zorah. From here we can see those who invent new mitzvahs, they just create new mitzvahs, whatever it is they come up with. 
It doesn't really matter if the mitzvah they made up is something that adds to the mitzvahs in the Torah or reduces, takes away from the mitzvahs in the Torah. made al al gava misrachas. The most, it's it's a demonstration of the most disgusting arrogance of the most vile type of arrogance that anyone can ever display. How would they even have the, the audacity within them to change even the smallest thing from that which the uh, creator of the universe has commanded us? The only way that this could have happened is because it emerges out of their arrogance. They can think that they're even wiser. They know more than the giver of the Torah. Somebody who's that arrogant can say, I understand, Hashem said what he said, but I've got something to add. Or I actually think that what Hashem said it makes a lot of sense, but I want to change it in this way or in that. What are you talking about? You know better than, than God? Are you suggesting that you have an idea that's better than God? They can say, They know better than God what it is worthwhile doing. How arrogant can you get? And that's what it means in Mishnah's Rebbe to say, Ki'ilu osa atzmai Eloha. It's as if they've made themselves into a god because they think the, that they're superior in their knowledge of what needs to be done. From this we can understand that what is the root, the essence of the sin of somebody who's moisif or someone who's megareha? Hainu begavos liboy. It's the arrogance of his personality. He, I think I know better. I'm the best. I'm the most brilliant. I'm the wisest. I'm the cleverest. I'm the greatest intellect. There's nothing I don't know. And whatever I don't know isn't worth knowing. And what I do know, I'm going, to, I'm going to do whatever I like. There's no humility. There's absolutely no sense of proportion between them and God. As we learnt in the Gemara in Saita, Somebody who makes themselves arrogant or allows themselves this liberty of being arrogant and pompous think they know better than anybody else and certainly if they think they know better than God that's like being an oive davoida zora the worst kind of heresy making yourself into a God lefichach that's exactly the reason why the second pasuk is in proximity to the first pasuk. To inform us that somebody who does this, somebody who adds to the mitzvahs in the Torah, I think this would be a great mitzvah. We should do it this way. Or somebody who reduces, who says, actually, this mitzvah is not so important. We don't need to do it. That person, is an over davoida zara. The loistam ka over davoida zara. It's not just just an over. I mean, that in itself would be bad enough. Ella ka over davoida zara ha gurua va shvela ba yosa. Baalpur is known to have been the most disgusting, have required you to do the most disgusting acts in its presence. The most disgusting of all the heresies that existed in ancient times of the pagan idols that were worshipped in ancient times was Baalpur. Baashela amitoid shall dovar. Somebody who's moisif or, or, or is who's guilty of baltoisif or guilty of a loisigru, that person has demonstrated that they have within them the root of kfira, the root of heresy, the zilzal and dismissal. With the God of truth, he who gave the Torah. It's such a powerful lesson. Our mitzvahs must follow the Messiah of Halacha. That's really it. Do you know what the mitzvah is that we keep? The one that's in the Shulchan Aruch. Not just doing what we fancy, not just deciding, you know, the Shulchan Aruch is good, but I, I know better than the Shulchan Aruch. I want to add another um, stringency. 
I want to make the mitzvah even stricter because the Shulchan Aruch wasn't strict enough. I feel that we should go the extra mile. And adding, and this is what's so powerful about this Dvar Torah, adding is as much reformed Judaism as not doing or changing a mitzvah. Reducing the number of mitzvahs, oh, that we all get. If somebody says you don't have to keep Shabbos as long as you keep kosher, you don't have to keep kosher or Shabbos as long as you're a nice person, makes you a good Jew, we understand that that's uh, a form of reform. Everybody gets it. But what are the, the, those people who, who've got all the chumras, who want to keep every chumra that exists and create their own? I don't need to mention what I'm talking about. We all get the message. It's also a form of reform. It's another kind of reform. But it's reform. Bal Tosif means Bal Tosif. It says who? It says here. Loi say sifu, the loi sigru. Don't make more and don't make less. Because if you do, you're like an Ovid Avoida Zorah. You don't know better than God. Nobody knows better than God. You don't know better than the Messiah of Halacha. You can't decide that the Messiah of Halacha wasn't strict enough or was too strict. The Messiah of Halacha, that's the gold standard. Anything else is Oved Avodah Zorah. We'll leave it here for today. Thank you so much. Thank you.